Hello everyone, this is White Lamb here. In today's Fuji Friday, we're going to be covering three news items. There's a lot to talk about, so let's go ahead and get right into it. The first thing that we're going to be talking about is firmware once again. This time it's good news. This is the firmware that we've been waiting for. It's going to be adding some new functionality to the Fuji X-T3 and also the X-H1. The X-H1, we actually have a lot of clarity on what we're going to get, and there's going to be a lot of cool things coming out for that camera system as well. Now, let's go ahead and jump right into the X-T3. This firmware is scheduled to come out in December, which is great. A lot of these things I've already talked about, so I'm just going to highlight a few of them that we got clarity on. I'm going to go ahead and just put it up on the screen right here. On item number three, we're going to have file sizes that are greater than four gigabytes. This is actually really useful for us video guys because it does improve the speed of post-processing, which is really cool for us. The thing to take out of this, though, is that you're going to need to use 64 gigabyte cards. The 32 gigabyte cards are going to be in the older format and it's not going to be supported. You will still get splits in your video after four gigabytes. So you really want to buy 64 gigabyte cards at this point for almost all of your Fuji cameras if you're going to be recording video it's going to be a little bit more expensive but trust me it's going to be well worth it the next thing to talk about is that it looks like for 4k mode we're going to be getting some different shutter speeds that we can deal with the one line that interests me is the dci 4k it looks like we're going to be getting 60p recording which would be awesome because right now if i look on the xt3 in dci 4k i can only do 30p if it actually goes up to 60p so being able to record slow motion in DCI 4K is going to be a definite benefit for cinematographers. They're really going to like that feature. It might be a game changer for some people. Definitely worthwhile to look at. I'm not sure if I'm reading that perfectly correct. If this feature is important to you, definitely take a read at it and see if you interpret it the same way that I did. The last bullet point that I want to talk about is item number six, in which H.264 you can actually now record in 400 megabytes per second. This is actually really useful for anybody who doesn't have a really modern editing computer and I do mean editing computer because when you actually edit in 265 it is really hard on my computer more on that a little bit later but being able to do it on H.264 which most modern computers can process really well that's really nice it just helps the workflow for people who don't have the most modern editing computers out there now to be honest with you I've been using the H.265 codec since I've gotten the X-T3 but I might actually bump back down to H.264 just because post-processing it's just so much easier to work with that file for most laptops and computers I don't know I'm still debating on that moving over to the X-H1 there is a firmware update going out for that and it's also scheduled around the same time whether or not it's going to be released at the same time as the X-T3 we don't really know that we just know that it's supposed to come out in December the biggest thing that we're looking for is increased stabilizations on a couple of lenses. Definitely take a look at all of the charts because there's only going to be a few select lenses that are going to be getting this improvement. Also, one important thing to note is that in order to get these improvements, you're going to need to update the firmware on your camera body and also the lenses. So you're going to have to do a double firmware update in order to get this increased stabilization on these lenses. Another important improvement for us video guys is that when we're panning very slowly, it looks like the image stabilization is going to give us a much smoother image. There's going to be less shakiness because panning is one of the core things that we do when we're actually doing video B-roll. Also, what's coming to the X-H1 is that we can actually record video that's greater than four gigabytes. And again, having bigger video files means that post-processing will be a lot easier. And this is something that I'm really looking forward to. Another interesting firmware update is that when you're using external power from the anchor power supplies, it'll actually indicate that on the LCD screen. So that's something that's very useful for people that actually use external power supplies. So I'm assuming the reason why they put that in is to ensure that people understand that their external power supply is working and that the internal battery isn't being drained. So that's the quick rundown of the firmware. I only highlighted a few specific things. Definitely pause the video if you want to read all of it. But there's some really great features coming out so I can't wait for December to roll around and start updating my cameras. So moving on from firmware, I do want to talk a little bit about the rumors of the X-H2. On FujiRumors.com, they were confirming from a trusted source that the X-H2 will not be coming out in 2019. This is really interesting because there are a bunch of people that are waiting for the X-H2 because they really want the capabilities 
from the X-T3 to show up on the next X-H camera because they want that image stabilization, the better ergonomics. And I completely understand because I'm looking forward to the X-H2 as well, but it looks like we're not going to be getting it in 2019, or at least that's what the rumor is right now. This kind of makes sense though, because a lot of the X cameras are on a two year development cycle. But if the XH cameras are on a two year development cycle, I would expect them to have new features in the XH2 over the X-T3. Otherwise, they should be on a one year development cycle. So I'm expecting some really great new features on the X-H2, but for the time being, it looks like we're not going to be seeing an X-H2 in 2019, which is a bummer because the X-T3's technology is definitely super awesome, and we would love to see it in the X-H cameras as soon as possible. Again, this is not official news, this is just rumors. Until we actually get a confirmation answer from Fuji Films, we can only speculate, but I am looking forward to the X-T30, which I would believe would be the next camera to come out. The last thing I want to report on is the X-T3 recording in 4K 60p. This is something that I've been trying for the last couple of weeks and I've been actually editing those files and holy cow, they are super hard to edit. It is really tough on your computers. This is something that I want people to actually understand is that in H.265 at 100 megabits, it is really tough on computers. On 30p, it's actually very editable on most modern computers. I don't think you'll have too much of a problem. You might get a stutter here and there, but it's very workable. But in 60p, on every computer that I've tried, it has crushed that computer. I do not have a top end editing computer, and it looks like in order for me to edit it straight from camera, those files, I would need a top end editing camera, a thread ripper of some sort, because I've just not been able to do it. I either had to use proxy files or I had to transcode it to another file in order to edit it. This is something that's kind of interesting because we're literally getting formats now in which the computers are not keeping up with, or at least not the computers that I currently have, but I have pretty modern computers and I've tried all of them and they really struggle with 60p 4K from the X-T3. I'm definitely looking into building a computer that can actually run these files straight from camera but I don't feel like the cost justification really warrants it. I just want people who are thinking about picking up an X-T3 and recording in slow motion in 4K to realize that it's really tough on your computers and there might actually be extra work that you're going to need to do in order to get that 4K slow motion. Also, don't forget that at 4K 60p, there is a crop factor that is involved. So I actually had to move to a new lens when I'm vlogging because I felt like my face was a little bit too big and it was just taking up too much of the screen. So I'm actually trying it with a 10 to 24, see how I like it. But to be honest with you, I might be moving back down to 4K 30 just because from a vlogging perspective, it was just much easier to do. It was easier on my computers. I can use smaller, lighter lenses, which is something that I really like to do. I like to keep my vlogging setups very light. So this experiment might be coming to an end fairly soon. That's all I have to report this week. Uh, definitely read through the firmware. Let me know what you're most excited about. I'm definitely really excited about having file sizes bigger than four gigabytes. Also, if you've been editing in 4K 60p, let me know how your experience has been because I'm truly interested to see if anybody's actually able to use the file directly from the camera and edit it on a timeline because I have not been able to do that. I had to transcode it, which is probably my preferred method right now because I don't really like working with proxy files, but definitely let me know if you're actually having success with that. But that's all I have this week. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.